Hi everybody, this is Julian from Hugging Face. In a previous video, I took you through the complete stack involved in accelerating Hugging Face models on AWS accelerators. We covered the chips, we covered the neuron SDK, we discussed some of the libraries. And in this video, I'm going to keep exploring that stack. And in fact, we're going to zoom on distributed training. So we'll talk about uh, Neuron X distributed and its integration into Optimum Neuron. And we'll cover things like uh, tensor parallelism and sequence parallelism, um, the zero one optimization, etc., etc. Very, very cool techniques. And of course, we'll run some tests and I'll show you how you can train a tiny llama for a start. And then we'll run distributed training on llama to 7 billion and uh, we'll look at the time and the cost, and I think you will be surprised. Let's get started. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, enable notifications so that you won't miss anything in the future, and please consider sharing the video with friends or colleagues who could be interested. I need all the help I can get to spread the good word. That's the stack we covered in the previous video, so um, if you haven't watched that, please take a look. I will put the link uh, in the video description. In this particular video, we're going to focus on distributed training. And uh, so first we should dive into Neuronex Distributed, which is a distributed training and inference library built by AWS. So let's look at this one. So just as a reminder, this is uh, an AWS library for distributed training and inference on uh, Neuron Core V2 devices, so INF2 and TRN1. Uh, it implements uh, some pretty advanced techniques, so tensor parallelism, uh, which we'll explain in detail, pipeline parallelism, which we'll also explain, and sequence parallelism, which, again, we will explain. Right, so those three techniques are implemented in this library um, we can combine them if we want, and in fact, we will during the demos. I have to say, these are very advanced techniques, and if you want to work directly with Neuronex distributed, you have to modify your code, and you can see some examples in the uh, AWS documentation. This is very, very difficult, right? Um, so, unless you really know what you're doing, um, and again, if you are, you're probably not watching this video, uh, I wouldn't touch this, right? I wouldn't touch it directly. So that's why we integrated this in Optimum Neuron, and uh, you will see how simple we made it, okay? Still, um, it's pretty interesting to uh, dive into Neuronex Distributed and understand more about tensor parallelism and sequence parallelism, which are already available in Optimum Neuron, and um, pipeline parallelism, which we are currently working on right now. Okay, so let's figure out what those things are, what are the benefits, uh, what we can expect from them, and then we'll see how we can very easily enable them in Optimum Neuron, and we'll do that during the demos, okay? This is the high-level view on the three techniques, okay? So let's start with tensor parallelism. As the name implies, we're going to parallelize tensors, so uh, basically model weight um, tensors. We split them into, uh, I guess, as many chunks as, as we have devices. So on the, in this example here, we see we have two devices. So let's say two neuron cores. Uh, we split the layers into chunks and we load the different layer chunks across those devices so that devices can only run part of the computation and they can run on everything in parallel, okay? And we'll look at that stuff in, in more detail. Pipeline parallelism, as you can see, um, it's not about splitting the, the layers, it's about splitting the model itself. So we split the model in layers, right? So here on this example, we see individual layers on three devices, but we could have multiple layers uh, on the same device. And we run batches, in fact, we'll see what those micro batches are, through the layers, forward and backward, and we need to orchestrate all of that, okay? Let's see how that works. And last but not least, uh, sequence parallelism is not about splitting um, the layers, it's not about splitting the model, 
It's about splitting the input sequence, right? And running input sequence chunks completely through the full model on each device. And obviously having some kind of synchronization uh, to make sure we don't lose the context across those chunks. Okay, so these are the three different ways uh, we can parallelize training. And uh, let's look at those in more detail. So let's start with tensor parallelism. So tensor operations are at the core, obviously, of uh, model training. And a lot of that means uh, multiplying matrices or tensors, if you want to use fancy words. And in fact, if we have multiple compute devices, which is the case when we work uh, with neuron uh, devices, we have multiple cores, maybe even multiple chips. Um, it'd be great if we could split that computation and run each chunk in parallel on, uh, on several devices. And that's exactly what we're doing here, right? So this comes from um, the Megatron LM paper from 2019. And it's pretty simple to understand. Um, if you look at the example uh, here on that slide, um, here we're running uh, A multiplied by B and store results into C. So we leave A untouched, right? Uh, we load A on, on all the devices. We split B in, in this example, two chunks, right? Assuming we have two devices and we load each B chunk on one device. And in parallel, we'll be able to run A multiplied by the first B chunk on one device and then A multiplied by the second B chunk on another device, completely in parallel. Uh, and then uh, gather, right? So merge the uh, resulting uh, C chunks and voila, as we say, right? So it's really about splitting tensors, distributed chunks, uh, computing the, the partial operations and concatenating, merging the partial results, right? And this is really what tensor parallelism is about. The benefit of this, of course, if uh, is we reduce memory usage on each device. We're not loading the full model. We're, lo we're loading some full tensors, but then only chunks of other tensors. So saving memory, meaning we can uh, work with very large models that wouldn't fit on a single compute device, right? Um, and we can shard, we can split those very large models across multiple devices and still be able to train them, okay? So as LLMs get bigger and bigger, um, we are still able to train them. The, the tensor parallelism level, as you would guess, is, uh, you know, the number of chunks we build. So in this example, we're using two-way parallelism because we split B in two to run on our two devices. This works for training, which uh, we'll uh, look at in the examples. It also works for inference. Um, so that's also, a, um, I would say, a distributed inference technique, if you want to call it that. So this is implemented by NeuronX Distributed. If you look at the code of the library um, in the repo, you'll see uh, layers, or I should say, parallel versions of transformer layers. Uh, we have uh, parallel embedding, which is exactly what you think. And we have uh, parallel uh, linear, so fully connected uh, layers, uh, row-wise and column-wise, okay? And of course, if you work with those, uh, those objects, then the tensor operations are automatically split or distributed across the different neuron cores. And as you would imagine, this is why you need to change your code. You would need to look at your model code and replace uh, your embeddings and your linear layers with those uh, parallelized versions implemented in NeuronX distributed, okay? So those are uh, the building blocks that are actually used in attention layers. And we can see this uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this illustration here. Right, um, and this is from uh, this is from the, the neuron docs, of course. Um, so here we can see uh, we're replacing basically 
um, some of the attention layers with their parallelized versions, right? And so all the blue blocks here can run in parallel on different devices, right? So literally um, allowing us to run uh, distributed training on different devices, right? So that's really what you would have to do manually um, if uh, if you had uh, if you, if you wanted to work with Neural Next distributed. So once again, uh, code modifications are required, and uh, well, that's not too easy. Data loading is different, and of course, model definition is different. Okay, so fortunately, this is part of Optimal Neuron. You won't have to change anything. You'll just have to say, "Hey, I want tensor parallelism. Uh, this is the level of parallelism I want." And, and that's all there is to it, okay? So uh, no, no problem there. Pretty cool. We'll see that in the demo, okay? So that's it for tensor parallelism, basically uh, allowing us to uh, break out attention layers and, um, and, and uh, fully connected layers across different devices and run them in parallel. Okay, so um, second technique. Second technique is pipeline parallelism, okay? So pipeline parallelism, as we saw, focuses on, on splitting the model at layer level. Okay, so it's a model parallelism technique. Different bits of the different layers of the model will run on different devices. Okay, so as I've said, if you have very large, very large models that wouldn't fit on a single uh, accelerator, you can just split the model and run different layers. On different devices of course now the problem is how do we orchestrate the forward propagation and the backward propagation of um, of, of data across those different layers living on different devices okay so this technique was first introduced by uh, gpipe in uh, in uh, 2018 as mentioned before we split or partition the model at layer level okay so again not necessarily one layer per device. It could be group of, uh, of layers running on the same device, okay? And distribute those layer chunks across the compute devices, okay? Now, the big problem, as I said, is orchestration because it's great that we have those different devices. It's great that they hold some of the model layers, but we want to keep everything as busy as possible, right? We don't want, you know, the first device holding the first few layers to be busy and the other, while it, let's say it's forward propagating data and then everything else doing nothing because, well, it's just waiting for data to show up, right? So we need to keep that infrastructure as busy as possible. And that's where the pipeline thing comes from. We're going to take the mini batches um, present in your training code, and we're going to split them further into micro batches, and, and you'll see why this is useful. So let's look at the example. So here, let's say we split our training mini batch into eight uh, micro batches, okay? And we have four uh, devices, okay, four compute devices, which are represented by the, the different lines in, the, in this graph here. Okay, so initially, of course, we have to start forward propagating. So we do that for micro batches, one, two, three, four. Okay, so sequentially, um, they get um, they get through the first device and the second device, etc. Okay, and at some point, um, we're fully forward propagating um, micro batch one. Okay, as as we see at the bottom here. And now we can start backward propagating it, okay? So it turns green, which means backward propagation, and it goes up again through uh, devices, you know, four, three, two, one, okay? And while we're doing that, obviously, we are still uh, uh, forward propagating uh, micro batches two uh, and three, okay? And then once, once one has been fully um, backward propagated, uh, then we can start with micro batch five, okay? And then when two has been fully backward propagated, we can forward propagate batch micro batch six, et cetera, et cetera. So you see how that works. And the, once we've initialized the first few micro batches, you can see 
everything is very busy, right? Um, in the middle of that illustration, we see really all the devices either forward propagating a, a micro batch or backward propagating a micro batch. And that's exactly what we want, right? Um, we want full parallelism. We want all the cores to be busy as much as we can at any given point, okay? So of course, once we get to the end of the mini batch, which means when we are done backward propagating micro batch eight, we need to wait and, and sync uh, the results for the, for the micro batch, uh, sorry, for the mini batch before we can start another mini batch composed of micro batches 9, 10, 11, 12, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then we do that again. So we, we're not getting 100% uh, 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 hardware usage. Uh, we're never getting that anyway. Uh, but we're pretty close, right? We're pretty close and um, and we hopefully maximize um, hardware usage as we run the different micro batches across the pipeline. Okay, so pretty cool technique. So that's what we see here. Eight micro batches run in parallel across four calls. Okay, so in theory, there is no limit to the maximum um, model size we can uh, train here because at, we could add um, just more devices uh, to hold more layer chunks and uh, and keep uh, orchestrating the micro batches or, or across all those cores of course that's theory at some point uh, you know it gets too complicated to there's too much um, there's too much communication overhead but this can scale uh, pretty high, and it's uh, it's a really interesting technique. Okay, so that's pipeline parallelism. Uh, unfortunately, not yet available in Optimum, but uh, hopefully very soon uh, we're working on it. Okay, let's move on to the next technique, which is sequence parallelism. Okay, so we just saw tensor parallelism and pipeline parallelism. And those help scale compute, basically. Okay, we just bring more devices to the mix uh, in order to run um, um, more compute in parallel, and uh, and that's great. And we can train uh, large models with that. Yet there's a problem that uh, tensor parallelism and uh, pipeline parallelism don't solve, and that's um, basically memory usage in the last um, layers of, uh, of attention, and specifically um, when we compute activations. Because as we saw here, um, again, all the blue blocks, remember, are, are parallelized uh, layers. At the end, you still need to uh, concatenate results. And on every core, uh, you will have full activation values. And of course, if you're working very large models, then that means you have high memory usage across nodes and you know, it's, uh, it's not scalable. You, you could scale your compute, but you could be you know, suffering from out of memory errors uh, just because of that. Okay, so that's um, what sequence parallelism is, uh, is trying to solve basically. And uh, this is a, a pretty new technique. So as mentioned before, we're splitting the input sequence Okay, um, so if you have, let's say, uh, I don't know, uh, 2K tokens, uh, you and you have four devices, then you'll split those 2K tokens into four sub uh, sequences. Each sub sequence is processed on a device. Okay, and um, so you will only need memory for that sub sequence in those final layers. And, uh, and that means you can scale to longer sequences and longer context, which uh, a lot of us are doing right now. And of course, you need some kind of, uh, of synchronization so that at the end, obviously, you can still produce the final output uh, coming from uh, the, uh, the processing of those uh, sub-sequences. And the cores implement uh, a distributed algorithm called ring self-attention, which I won't go into, it's too involved for this, but you can go and uh, and read the paper if you want. So at the end, we still get the, the final sequence, um, but along the way, 
we only consumed um, enough memory on each node to call the subsequences. Okay, so we hopefully solve that uh, high memory usage problem we have. Okay, again, in theory, uh, we could process infinitely long sequences with this just by adding cores, but that's just theory and things will break before that. Okay, um, so that's it for Neuron X distributed. And again, I won't show you code with Neuron X distributed because I think it's uh, it's probably too complicated for uh, for most of us out there. But if you're interested, feel free to go and read the doc. Okay, so instead we're gonna go up one level and see how we can implement this uh, very very easily with Optimal Neuron. Okay, so. As just as a reminder, Optimal Neuron is our hardware acceleration library for neuron devices, so Trainium and Inferentia. And using it could be simpler, I think. All you have to do is install Optimal Neuron, or I guess use our AMI if you're on AWS, as we will see. And uh, just import the Neuron Trainer as Trainer. And that's about it. And uh, your uh, your uh, transformers code should work completely unchanged, right? So pretty nice. Uh, keep in mind, models need to be compiled, uh, optimized for neuron cores for uh, for uh, training devices. Um, this is a one-time operation, and you can cache the the files, the output files, which are called NEF, uh, neuron executable file format files, on the hugging face up. Okay, all right, so let's dive into Optimum Neuron and see what distributed training techniques are available there. So before we talk specifically about uh, the um, um, tensor parallelism and sequence parallelism, there's another technique which, uh, which is quite popular uh, that uh, Optimum Neuron implements. And this is called the, the, the zero. Uh, so zero redundancy optimizer technique. Okay, so let's see what that is. So I guess we're familiar with uh, data parallelism, right? Which means uh, load the model across um, uh, a cluster of compute nodes. So a full copy of the model on, the, on each node. And then we run different batches uh, uh, across different nodes and we, we merge results. Okay, so that's data parallelism. We've been doing this forever. Um, we need a full copy of the model on each node. We need the gradients. We need the optimizer state. Okay, so we need everything on each device. That's fine. Um, we just need to know that um, in general, we'll need 4x um, um, the, the model size memory right to hold everything so if you have let's say i don't know an, an eight uh, gigabyte model model weights uh, then you'll need something like 32 gigs on each device to uh to not only load the model but also uh, run uh, gradients and and run optimization okay so that's a problem because again llms are getting bigger and bigger and um and even mid-sized llms uh, may not fit on your uh, on your uh, accelerator okay so that's uh, again the problem that uh, the zero is trying to solve again zero is a bit of a recursive uh, <laughs> acronym it stands for zero redundancy optimizer uh, this was introduced uh, in deep speed uh, a little while ago um, and in fact zero comes into different flavors so zero one where uh, we will partition the optimizer state okay so zero one looks like this we still load the, the model on each node we still um, load and, and manage the gradients on each node but we split the optimizer state across, across the nodes okay and that's that's great because that's the the larger chunk uh, the the optimizer state is really the the bigger uh, the bigger chunk we have to uh, manage on each device. Okay, so we save memory by just partitioning that. Okay, zero two uh, adds gradient partitioning, uh, and zero three will also partition parameters. So 
similar to tensor parallelism, okay? So these are more advanced. Optimum neuron at the moment supports 0, 1, okay? Um, which means we automatically partition the optimizer across the neuron cores. And again, this is the, the bigger saving. Um, so it's, uh, it's very interesting. How difficult is it to, um, to do this when it's really simple? If you work with the Transformers library, um, you just enable 0, 1 equal true in your training args. And if you work with our uh, training scripts, you just enable dash dash 0, 1. Okay, and it will look something like this. Okay, and in fact, uh, we'll we'll run that uh, <laughs> we'll run that example in a few minutes. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the script we would run. Um, causal language modeling on tiny llama on the wiki text data set, and just say my dash dash zero one, and you're good to go. Okay, so that's it for zero one. Uh, again, we'll give it a try. Now let's see how we can do tensor parallelism and sequence parallelism very, very easily with optimal neuron. So um, tensor parallelism is supported. Of course, it's based on the Neuronex distributed library. And what optimal neuron does is as you load um, a model for distributed training with tensor parallelism, it will automatically transform um, the, the layers into parallel layers, okay? And you can see the, the actual code from the library, and don't worry, that's not the code you have to write. This is really to show you what happens when you load the model here, right? So we have implementations for um, fully connected layers, parallel MLP, cross-entropy, embeddings, self-attention, um, and we can see the list of uh, supported models in uh, in the documentation and in the in the repo in fact okay so if you look at the code sample you can see here uh, we're parallelizing llama so if you say hey uh, i want to run distributed training with llama using tensor parallelism then as optimal neuron loads the llama model it will automatically replace um, the embedding layers and the self-attention layers etc with parallel versions okay and then of course load the checkpoint into uh, into that model the weights are are unchanged we're just automatically replacing the vanilla layers with the the parallel layers so that's very very cool so enabling this is as simple as enabling tensor parallel size in training args or in sample scripts okay um what's the best value well i guess the the ideal value is the smallest value that helps you fit the model on your devices. Um, it doesn't make, in my opinion, a of sense to go with the largest value because, okay, sure, you could split, you know, eight ways, 16 ways, 32 ways, but then um, probably the cost of uh, distributed communication could be, I don't know, maybe problematic, okay? So try with two and then, uh, and then uh, four, Etc. And, and and see how that goes. Not all values are are possible. Um, you you'll see that in the in the documentation. Um, but start with two and then uh, double it pretty much. If you um, if you still have um, uh, I guess memory issues. Okay. So tensor parallelism comes for free. <laughs> Just a parameter away. Sequence parallelism is even better. It's on by default. Okay, uh, so you don't need to uh, you don't need to do anything here, um, and you can disable it if you want. Uh, so disable sequence parallel um, in training args or in sample scripts. Okay, so that's really uh, that's really all there is to this. And you can see again, optimal neuron is bringing those uh, fancy techniques to everybody. Right? Um, you don't you don't need to tweak. You don't need to change your model. In fact, Optimum Neuron will automatically do that for you, and uh, and that's pretty cool. Okay, all right. Now we want to see this stuff in action. Uh, before we do that, I want to remind you that um, you don't need to do any kind of setup. Uh, there are a couple of um, AMIs you can use. There's the uh, Deep Learning AMI Neuron from our friends at AWS, um, which is quite nice. Uh, we tend to think 
ours is a little nicer because it comes with uh, optimal neuron and basically uh, all the all the hogging face libraries out of the box and um, and that's what I'll show you right now we'll just fire up uh, a Trainium instance with the hogging face AMI and you'll see we can run code straight away zero setup okay so let's launch the instance and then we'll run the demos very easy so starting from the EC2 console click on launch an instance let's give it a name Okay, uh, we're going to select an AMI and I recommend starting from our hugging face AMI. Just look for hugging face, click on marketplace AMIs, and that's the first, right? So let's click on this. It's free to use. We'll just pay for the instance. Okay, so select this AMI, it comes with everything we need. So we won't need to run any kind of setup. Next, let's fire up a training instance. So I'm going to go with the bigger one, um, 32XL, because I'm not paying my bills. And in fact, I'm going to select TRN1N. And if you watched the previous video, you know this one is uh, just faster for distributed training because it just has uh, more chip-to-chip uh, -chip bandwidth. So that's the one I want. Okay, I'm going to need a key pair. Let's select mine. Okay, and I, yeah, I'll need to SSH to this. So we'll create a security group. Let's add maybe a bit more storage. You never know. And let's go with spot instances to minimize cost. Just click on this. Okay, and launch it. Click on the orange button. And hopefully, they should tell me I've got a running instance. Okay, so my instance is up and I've SSH to it. Uh, we can run run ls to see our devices. So no surprise, 16 devices, two cores each. 32 total okay on the right we see neuron top and of course at the moment uh, we are not doing anything at all so we can see that everything has been uh, has been nicely installed an easy way to check this is something like this and we'll see all the uh, all the neuron packages from AWS right uh, the neuron compiler etc and we see optimum neuron as well okay so we really don't need to um, to set up anything here okay. the only thing we need to do is just to clone the optimum neuron repo because that's where our examples are okay all right so let's look at our first demo and uh, first we're gonna play with tiny llama okay so let's start with fine-tuning tiny llama on the wiki text uh, data set. So Tiny Llama is just a scaled down version of, uh, of the Llama model, same architecture, but just smaller. Uh, you can find it, of course, on the hub uh, and the Wikitext data set as well. Okay, so go check those out if you're curious. First, I'm going to run uh, vanilla distributed training on, uh, on, that, uh, on that training instance, and then we'll add 0, 1, and TP. Let's try this. Okay, I'm in the right place. This looks good. Run. The the environment variable, the malloc thing, is just to uh, work around a, a malloc bug in libc that causes uh, uh, OOM problems from time to time. So this is the first run on this instance. So um, it will... Um, uh, will it compile? <laughs> That's the big question. Will it compile the model? So hopefully not. Because I have run this um, same job on uh, on other instances in the past, not on this one. So this one doesn't have a local cache. But as I've run this on other instances a few days ago and pushed the compiled files, the NEF files, back to the hub, um, those compiled files should be fetched. So hopefully we are not going to compile the full model here. 
uh, and uh, and we should be downloading. Oh, there, there they are. Yes, great success. Okay, so that's what we see here. Uh, we see those NEF files being pulled from the hogging face hub, and that's coming directly from our global cache that we're managing. Uh, go check out the AWS Neuron Cache organization on the hub. That's where we we host that stuff. Okay, so. It's loading, um, and uh, we should see some stuff happening on the neuron devices uh, pretty soon. Let's give it a minute, and then we should see the neuron course blinking. Oh, here we go. Okay, well, we certainly see them blinking here, right? And of course, my face is in the way. Let's move it for a second. <laughs> All right, uh, we see memory usage on uh, on the different cores, right? Let me zoom out a little bit. So if you look at each core, you can see how, how much memory is allocated to tensors, how much memory is allocated to model code, etc., etc. Okay, and this is clearly training here, so pretty good. So let me come back to my original location there we are and this will run in 11 minutes or something okay so we're not gonna run this and wait for 11 minutes uh, i've done this before i've got all the numbers and let me just show you how you enable uh the uh the other options and then we'll look at the final results Enabling 0, 1 or tensor parallelism is as easy as adding the corresponding parameter to that command line. And well, it runs very much the same. Um, training time is a bit different and memory usage is a bit different. Um, but we'll look at the, the final results in, um, in a second. Um, and as you can see, this is all you need to do, right? Just pass the right parameters. And again, I'm not going to compile anything because um, because I've run those uh, particular configurations before. Okay, so we can see the model loading, etc. Feel free to run this completely uh, and uh, and look at your own numbers. But of course, in the interest of time, I'm going to interrupt this and uh, and show you what the final results are. Okay, so how did we do with those different configurations? So the vanilla job First line, no tensor parallelism, no zero one, ran in 707 seconds with memory usage close to max, uh, surprisingly. So you can see even with uh, a small 1.1 billion model, we're close to uh, consuming the 16 gigs available on each core. Okay, so that tells you how quickly <laughs> you may want to consider uh, more efficient, more distributed techniques. Uh, enabling 0, 1 um, helped us save a bit of memory, right? Um, not as much because we only uh, we only split um, on two uh, on two neural cores here. Uh, this is a small model. There's no reason to do more. So the optimizer state is uh, is not split as much as you would think uh, if you used uh, 32 cores, let's say. Uh, training time is quite better. Um, 633 seconds, that's a 10% improvement um, because I guess each core is just uh, managing, a, well, I guess half of the optimizer state. So, um, well, we're save, clearly saving some compute there. Um, next configuration is a two-way tensor parallelism uh, with no zero one. And, uh, and here we can see memory usage is, uh, is very efficient. So splitting the, the model tensors uh, two ways is saving almost 50% of memory. So, well, 45%, close enough. So I guess my gut feeling told me that that's what we should see. Um, and of course, if we, if we split even further on, on more cores, then we would keep uh, lowering memory usage on each core, which maybe gives us the opportunity to run larger batch sizes. Um, I didn't try it. Um, but as you have more memory available now, maybe you could bump batch size and speed up the training job. 
Training time is a little higher than the, the baseline, uh, probably because we just need to do more uh, sync, more uh, distributed communication to uh, uh, to gather the, the tensor chunks, just like we saw in the previous explanation. And then I thought, why not try both? Uh, and well, that wasn't a really great idea. Um, so memory usage um, isn't really much better. And training time is quite slower. So I don't have a super uh, definitive explanation on why, but it just goes to show, you know, there is such a thing as <laughs> enabling too many features. And, uh, and I think you have to keep things simple and figure out whether you want to, uh, I guess, uh, partition the full model uh, to uh, to save uh, memory on each core because the model is so large it just wouldn't fit or if you're just trying to uh, to I guess accelerate some of the uh, optimization process through zero one right uh, which clearly worked um, but that would still require that the model fits uh, completely so Maybe it's an artifact. Maybe it's just a bogus example. If you have a question, if you have feedback or an opinion on why this is not performing well, just leave a comment. Okay. All right. Uh, that's it for Tiny Llama. There's one more thing I want to show you. Of course, I want to show you uh, a Llama 2, a 7 billion training. In other videos, I've shown you Llama 2 um, um, with uh, LoRa and QLoRa, etc. Here, None of that. We are training the full um, BF16 Llama 2. No LoRa, no QLoRa. Okay. The code is uh, remarkably similar. As you can see, the main difference, of course, is this time I'm going to use the 32 cores available on that training instance. And uh, keep in mind, it's TRN1N. So uh, with enhanced... Uh, chip to chip communication so more bandwidth should be fast and i'm going to enable tensor parallelism uh eight ways okay so the llama 2 tensors will be split um in uh, eight uh, chunks for uh many operations hopefully helping me um, not only fit uh llama 2 on, on that uh, instance but also uh, accelerating in the process okay so let's just grab this and uh and run the code and see how that works again i've run this on previous instances so uh, well it will still download the the llama 2 model which will take a minute or two um, but we shouldn't see any compilation steps okay so let's uh give it a few minutes to do its thing uh and uh and i'll come back once we're actually training and we see the 32 cores blinking Okay, so I waited a few minutes, and um, and we are definitely training. Um, and again, we can see. I think yes, we use um, we used model uh, artifacts from the from the cache. Yeah, we can see it here. You can see the NEF files were downloaded. Okay, so that's pretty cool because it means you don't have to recompile. If you run the same example as I do, uh, you won't have to recompile. And so now we're training. Okay, so we have um, eight way tensor parallelisms. So we have eight way tensor parallelism, um, meaning the model tensors have been uh, split into eight uh, chunks and loaded across different cores. And we see this thing is happily training. Okay. And it should take something like 22 or 23 minutes. So we're not going to wait. Of course, I've done this before. I've got the numbers. So let's see the final results. Um, I guess the, the takeaway here is you can see how simple it is to fine tune uh, Llama to 7 billion on a single training instance. Okay, so let's look at the results. So we're training for three epochs. And in my previous run, this took just a little more than 24 minutes okay, and that's just the training time i didn't time the the checkpointing uh, which could take a, a, a few more minutes okay so about 25 let's say 25 minutes for three epochs on a reasonably you know a reasonably large data set um, 
for Llama 27B. In terms of cost, the, the on-demand price for the, uh, the instance, as you can see here, is $24.78 an hour. But you know how much I love spot pricing. And if you look at spot price history, uh, you'll see that um, over the last months, I guess, um, spot prices have been reasonably stable at under $9 an hour. Okay. And in fact, if let's check the uh, EC2 console, see what kind of discount I got for real. Okay, so this is the spot request for my instance. And if I click on saving summary, I got this one for $8.99, yeah? So under nine again, which accounts for 64% 64 savings. Okay, so again, if you don't know what spot is, uh, my friend, you need to learn today because this is how you save 60, 70, sometimes more percent on uh, EC2 instances. So that means, I guess, accounting for checkpointing, etc. Let's say uh, this thing took about 30 minutes. It would cost us at $9 an hour. It would cost us under $5, right? So I think that's pretty cool. Fine tuning the full BF16 Llama to 7 billion for $5 um, is nice. And uh, why am I seeing people complaining about fine tuning for hundreds or thousands or even more? Uh, you can do it for $5. Okay. And this is how. Okay. Um, well, that's really what I wanted to tell you today. Um, a few more links and resources that I already shared in the previous video on uh, neuron and, uh, and neuron examples etc uh, etc et so feel free to go and check out those uh, notebooks and code samples and docs and blog posts and uh, you'll be on your way all right that's it for today i hope you like this video if that's the case please give it a thumbs up subscribe to the channel enable notifications and share the video with more of your colleagues and friends i need all the help i can get to spread the good word there's more coming on the optimum neuron and uh, I would say model acceleration in general. So I'll see you and until next time, keep rocking.